Je suis sûr que ça va être parfait. Je suis pas inquiète. Je me dis que ça va être parfait. J'ai complètement le Ah, ça va aller. Tu vas voir. Si tu es. Je suis désolé, j'ai complètement ça. C'est bon Bonjour à toutes et tous. Good morning to everybody. Dear Steve Bourget, dear Kim Vazdevil, curators of the exhibition, the scientific committee of the exhibition, dear partners, dear lenders, and dear friends, welcome everyone. Very pleased on behalf of the president of the Musée Quai Branly, Jacques Chirac, Emmanuel Casarero, and, and be here with us today to open this exhibition, to inaugurate this colloquium. Uh, from slavery to the black and Indians, the extraordinary journey of Af African Americans in New Orleans. I'd like to thank you all for attending these two days of discussions, which uh, will help us um, look at the history of African Americans in Louisiana from New France to present day. And welcome to the public here in this auditorium, as well as those who are following us online. I'd especially like to thank all of the speakers who have agreed to share their expertise with us during um, today's uh, events and tomorrow's events, uh, thus allowing us to explore in greater depth many of the themes addressed in the exhibition From Slavery to Black Indians. Also an opportunity for me, for the museum, to thank all those who have made this exhibition possible. Of course, the two curators, Steve Bourget, who is in, uh, who's here with us today and who's in charge of the Americas collection at the museum, and you all know him, and Kim Vazdeville, um, professor at Xavier University in Louisiana. But I also like to thank them, our colleague uh, from the Louisiana State University, who is a partner for this exhibition. I'd also like uh, to also congratulate and thank all of the teams uh, at the museum, especially the Cultural De Development Department uh, for this ex excellent exhibition and um, for having contributed to this very fine project. And thanks to all of those made exceptional loans to this exhibition. I'm particularly thinking of all those who have agreed to us, uh, by lending us their costumes, thus allowing a larger public to discover them in a museum, in our museum. Without these exceptional loans, this project, this exhibition would not have been possible. And we're extremely grateful for um, and very proud of the trust that you've placed in us. And lastly, uh, to end with uh, another word of thanks, I'd like to thank my colleagues in the research and education department who are actually the ones who are organizing the symposium. And uh, I'd like to uh, particularly thank Anna Lavon, uh, who has been the lead uh, for organizing this um, symposium. So these two days of symposium, that support the exhibition. Uh, the exhibition was inaugurated a few days ago with a lot of success, a lot of enthusiasm that was shown by those, uh, the visitors who have already seen the exhibition these past a couple of days. And this is an opportunity, uh, well, it's a great moment of pride and gratitude for us to be able to show this very powerful exhibition um, to the Parisian and to the French and European public. And this exhibition is an emblematic exhibition for several reasons. First of all, because, uh, and this is something that surprises all of us um, today, uh, this is an exhibition that gives a rather large place to history. For us at the Quai Branly Jacques Chirac Museum, placing cultures in a larger time scheme is a recurring challenge, and this is brilliantly met in this show. And 
as you'll see during the symposium, we're presenting the museum's oldest uh, American Indian collections, uh, which actually belong to some of the oldest collections in the world. Um, and we're also, we're also presenting the oldest African masks. Um, and we're actually tracing uh, back to the first sources of the first French colonization, which is a period that is very poorly known here in France. And all of this is very fundamental for us at the museum. And this is our mission. And this is ex ex exactly what we're trying to do in this show, uh, i.e. anchor these stories in the long term. This exhibition, secondly, is also emblematic for the following reason. It gives... It highlights the memories of very dark episodes of a shared history. The history of colonization, slavery, segregation, racism, and also highlights the positive dynamics of resistance to this violence. And all of these subjects are going to be the heart of the uh, theme of, uh, of violence, which is uh, uh, which this exhibition wishes to uh, shed light upon. And I think we we'll managed to do this with a lot of tact and with a lot of scientific rigor, thanks to all of your contributions. The notion of um, métissage and interculturality and fruitful dialogue is something that uh, many of our visitors uh, uh, consider very valuable when they come to the museum. And, uh, the cultural dialogue between various uh, cultures and uh, and this fruitful dialogue is also uh, something that uh, has been uh, very dear to our hearts at the museum and in fact has been the motto of our museum since 2006. And finally, the Black Indians exhibition is also emblematic for us uh, because more than ever today our mission is to show living cultures and when you know nothing about the carnival of the black Indians, it's extremely um, joyful to discover all of these parades of the black Indians, because what after all could be more lively and more alive than these parades and of the black Indians, the skull and bones of the baby dolls. And as you know, this living heritage, uh, thanks to C. Bourget, is already present in our collections. Um, with two costumes that are among the favorites of our public, the uh, white bison and the uh, big chief Daryl Montana's costume that actually opens the exhibition. And in fact, these two costumes are part of the permanent collection and they're in, in some ways the best sellers of our uh, museum's collections. And so this um, aspect of liveliness and this uh, idea of showing l live cultures is something that is also very dear to our hearts. And we try to do this, to highlight this through material means, but also through immaterial heritage. And this is what we're trying to do with this Black Indians exhibition. And of violence and of residence, this exhibition and the themes that it addresses is for us the very essence of what our museum can and wants to show. Cultures that are very much alive, anchored in a long history, built at the crossroads of memories and exchanges throughout the world. And we're very proud to be able to show you this exhibition thanks to all of your collaboration and your cooperation. And we're very proud to shed light on this um, lesser known part of France's history in New Orleans. And I hope that uh, we'll uh, be able to inspire people to go visit New Orleans uh, at the time of Mardi Gras and discover this part of the US. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the museum, I hope you enjoy this symposium. Uh, over the course of two days, which will certainly be very rich uh, in quality and in terms of exchanges. Thank you very much. Alors, uh, bonjour à tous. Je suis Good morning, Bourget. everyone. My name is Steve Bourget. I'm a co-curator for this exhibition at the Musée du Quai Branly, Jacques Chirac. I would also like to extend 
thanks to our friends and to our colleagues who made this project possible. Not only to participate in this uh, symposium, but also to uh, turn this exhibition into a success. I would like to thank all the teams from the Musée Cabranly Jacques Chirac, uh, which included several dozen people there was a lot of pleasure, but also a lot of challenges organizing this exhibition against the backdrop of COVID. We had to organize a number of activities and meetings remotely, which was not easy. I would like to thank our colleagues from New Orleans. Our friends in New Orleans were key in making this exhibition a reality. Thank all my uh, now friends and uh, uh, from New Orleans for making this happen. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been possible. I want also to say that uh, my only job in this was to uh, try to uh, show once a few stories for from a very complex history. So the idea was to bring the behind what we see in the streets during uh, Mardi Gras and uh, St. Joseph Day in New Orleans, uh, the logic of culture, how things happen, why they happen, why do they dress like that. Uh, and I didn't answer the whole question, but at least we hope, uh, Kim and I, uh, to have uh, been able to show you some of the uh, some of the, str not the strings, but perhaps the, the ways of looking at uh, this uh, extremely interesting uh, system. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me. It was, and it still is a pleasure for me to work on this. Now we haven't finished working. We still have uh, a lot of uh, work ahead, but this was very exciting, very stimulating, and this opened up uh, avenues of work with our colleagues, uh, both uh, in uh, New Orleans and in other regions. So this is uh, a story that uh, has started but is not over. There's uh, still a number of research and publications uh, to come today, and tomorrow I will act uh, as a master of ceremony. Uh, as uh, Hermann Hesse used to say, I will be uh, ahead of the Magister Ludi. I will make sure that everything is uh, on the par with uh, our schedule. I think the first symposiums or colloquium that took place in the before the start of history already followed uh, the same model. Today we are going to start with uh, Big Chief Victor Harris, who's going to talk to us about the art of being a big chief. You will discover what that means. He will be followed by Lakisha Simmons, who will talk to us about Christian City Girls. Searching for Pleasure in a Racist World. Lakisha Simmons wrote extraordinarily important and interesting things about uh, that aspect, and we are going to learn a lot with her. Between 11 and 11.30, we will welcome Rachel Bronlin from the Neighborhood Story Project in New Orleans, in the University of New Orleans. She worked a lot with members of the African American, including big chiefs. She will tell us about the magnificent books that they created, developed, and published. And that will shed a very interesting light on the culture of uh, Mardi Gras Indians. And finally, we will leave the floor to Philippe Charlier from the Musée du Cabranly, who will talk to us about African tradition of uh, the dances of death and spirits, Gungun, Gelede, and Zangbeto. I will be back at the end of the morning to tell you more about uh, what we could expect, what we can expect for the afternoon. Everyone has about 30 minutes. I want to make sure that the symposium uh, uh, is relaxed. We are going to go with the flow. What we want to do is to make sure that we learn from each other, that we can have a conversation and continue the conversation that was kick-started with this exhibition from slavery to black Indians.
cheap. Uh, do you want to come here? Or would, uh, I think it would be easier for you to speak from here. Uh, I just wanted to say a few words. As an introduction for Victor, Victor is a big chief, but he's also an extraordinary personality. He's incredibly kind and amazingly smart. Thank you. Good morning. Before I get started, I want to. Uh, Give honor to my chief, Allison Chief Tootie Montana. Give praise to him. He's my chief. He was my chief for 52 years of massing Mardi Gras Indian. And I mention his name first in order to, for you to understand where I'm coming from. Uh, 52 years he massed. That was the longest anyone ever massed in New Orleans as a Mardi Gras Indian. So, uh, Big Chief, he sits up there in heaven right now. And he's the only chief up there with the 50 year table, 50 year of making suits. That's a great honor. He was the first one to make 50 Mardi Gras carnival suits, the very first one. And what makes me so proud now to be a chief is to follow in his footsteps. I have massed 56 years making the suits. 56 years I have done it, consecutive years, without missing a year of massing Mardi Gras Indian. And no one in the history of our culture have ever done that, no one. I'm the very first one that consecutively massed 56 years. I mentioned my chief name because, like I said, he's up there in heaven now. And I was the first one to be invited to his 50-year table. Man, when I made 50 years of massing Mardi Gras Indian, that was one of the proudest moments of my life uh, to say that I was going to be invited at my big chief table. See, because it's all about honor and respect. It's not just something we do just running around it's about honor and respect. This is all about our culture. We, we're in a spiritual world. It's not just a parade. It's not something we just do, run around the streets or anything like that. And when I got to my chief table, them 50 years, imagine me, myself, being the very first one to sit at that 50 year table the very first person to sit at his table. So you, you can imagine how proud I am to say that I follow in my chief foot, footsteps. Uh, chief was a great man. He was a great man. Chief died, he lived and died for what he believed in our culture. He died at the podium talking to the, to the, to the city council, the, the district attorney, the DA, the mayor, explaining to them about the indecency, the way we were being treated. And he was explaining this to them. And he was so much involved in talking, he died on the spot. And this is what made me honor him even more because he died and he fought for what he believed in. So he left a legacy for us to follow. He passed the baton to me. He did 52 years. I would never dream that I would go above. With 53 years, 54 years, 55 years, 56 years, and if the Spirit is with me, if God is with me this year, it'll be 57 years. And I'm gonna continue doing it as long as I possibly can. I love being a chief. I love being a chief. It's not an easy job. And I doesn't get paid cash for it. <laughs> I don't get paid at all except for the reward 
from the honor and respect that the people give me in my community, in my neighborhood. And it makes me proud to say when I'm walking down the street in my community and people see the chief passing by and they waving their hands, hollering, hey chief, hi chief, how you doing chief? And they all welcome me into their homes. Children, when they see me, they're running down the street, they're following me because they want to grow up into this. They want to be involved in this. Believe me, it's a culture. It is a culture. It's just like a university too. You have to move up, step higher, another grade. You gotta keep moving up into positions. You just cannot just say you want to be this. You cannot just say that. You have to be obedient. You definitely have to be obedient. You have to listen. You have to pay attention in order to learn. <clears throat> like I said, I've been involved with this up my whole entire life. I'm born into this culture, and I love this culture. I live for it, and I'll die for it as well. I breed culture. My life is culture. If it wasn't for culture, I don't think I would be standing here speaking to you today. All of my education came up through culture. Culture teach you how to, to share, how to care. It teach you everything that you need to know to live. It's a very good culture. Like I say, it's a spiritual culture as well. I believe in my God. Yes, being a chief is not easy. It's not easy at all. Because you're going to have those who are going to be behind your back that will try to stab you in your back, that wants to be in your position. There are going to be those in the tribe that are going to start the, the trouble behind your back. And that's what's so good about being a chief, being strong, firm, being able to handle that, conduct yourself in a proper manner. It's not easy, but I love the job because I love my community, I love my neighborhood, I love my city, and I love my culture. It's a good job. It's a beautiful job. I have grandchildren, 37 grandchildren I have, and I'm teaching them every day everything that I learned through the culture. They have to learn that. They have to learn how to listen and, and be able to understand what we are doing. So we teach them little by little. We start off just with a pencil. Just tell them draw anything, something, a line, a circle, a triangle. That's a beginning, that's a start. Then we get the scissors and tell them cut that circle out, that triangle, or that square. You see, they're learning a little bit more of something else. Then we give them a needle and thread. <coughs> Excuse me. We give them the needle and thread. And we have bees on the side. And we ask them to pick up the bees and learn how to put them bees on that needle and bring it down the thread. That's all we ask of them. We don't ask them to do anything else. And once they consistently start doing that, well, you see, they're on their way. They're on their way. I recall the first time my teacher, Melvin, Mr. Reed, taught me how to uh, do all of the things I'm speaking upon. We have teachers. Yes, we have teachers. You have to be taught this. You have to be taught this. My teacher, I'm telling you, this guy used to make his own furnitures. He made everything. Wow, I wish I was that talented. He taught me. So I had a great teacher as well. Being a chief man, I'm telling you, 
I mean, I, I, I'm proud, I can say that. I am definitely proud of being the chief. I'm honored being the chief. Like I said, it's all about respect, honor and respect. And when you can feel honored and respected, then you should feel good about yourself. That's your reward. I'm just like, I'm a father to, to, to the whole neighborhood, to the community. They, they look forward to me being able to explain to whatever necessary needs or whatever they need in their life. Or what could I do to help them? I, exp I explain as much as I possibly can to the children, to the elders. I'm there to help the people in my community. They're always calling on, up on me because they know who I am. They know I'm there for them. Whatever they need, whatever their needs are, they call and they say, Chief, I'm in need for this. Chief, I'm in need for that. And I'm going to be there for them. And I have warriors. I have workers. And then whatever these people need, those are the people who I go and get to help our people in our community. And believe me, Carnival, Mardi Gras is one of the most powerful days in the city for us. I'm telling you, people that you would never see, within, you haven't seen in 10 months, maybe five years or so or long. When Carnival come, Mardi Gras come, everybody is coming to my house. They all come to my home because they know what's going on there. It's the big reunion. And that's what's so great about it. You'll be able to see all of your friends, your families, you know, your relatives, you know, because they know the spirit is coming. They know that's where you go there to have a great time, to feel good. And there's never no illness in my house during that time. Never no illness. That spirit keeps that away from us. It keep evil out. Evil could not get in because that good spirit is there. That's why I'm so proud to say that my given spiritual cultural name is the spirit of fire. That was given to me through God. God gave me this power. God put me into this position. I wasn't elected from the people. The people accepted me, but God put me in a position. I feel so good to tell you how I feel about being who I am, the spirit of fire, yeah, yeah, and I'm telling you, it's great power. Believe me, believe me, I can heal people. I can heal folks. They tell me all the time, Chief, Miss so-and-so is not feeling well. You need to go and see her. That's what I do. And when I get there, these people could be laying flat on her back. She could be flat on her back, barely breathing. But when she see the spirit of fire, I'm just like a pastor to her. That spirit is so great, it makes her get up, rise. And she start talking, speaking like nothing was never wrong with her. Because that's the power of the spirit of fire, yeah. -ya. It's a good spirit. The spirit of fire, yeah. -ya. It don't exclude, it include everyone in the world. It's not just because it's our culture and it just belongs to just the black race. No, that's not true. Just like God doesn't just belong to one race. God belongs to all people. And that's what the spirit of fire yeah, yeah, represent. All people, the world. I love being who I am. I'm gonna say that again, it's a great job. That's what got me here today. It didn't took, it taken me around the world. I didn't been to the White House representing our culture. The black, black hills. <laughs> I didn't been on reservations, honored by other people on the other side of the world, 
other cities, the other countries in our, our country of United States of America. The spirit of fire, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, believe me, it's a powerful spirit, it's a great spirit, it's a loving spirit. I love it. See, my job is not hard because I love what I do. That's what makes it easy. You know, I get therapists. People come to me for, Chief, what is wrong with me? That's what they ask me. What is wrong with me, Chief? Well, you have to t talk to me. You have to tell me your problem. Let me know something about your problem, then I can tell you what's wrong with you. It's good being a chief. It's great being a chief. <coughs> Excuse me. Like I say, I'm a teacher. I'm a therapist. I'm a doctor. I'm, I'm everything to my community, to my people. That's what a chief does. But I have assistance as well. I'm not just an individual that's trying to do everything alone. I have assistance. I have people that advise me to do things as well. Can't do it alone. You can only do so much yourself because there'll be things you're going to miss. There's a line you're going to miss. There's a, a, a dot you're going to miss or a cross on the T you're going to miss. And that's why you must have a right hand and a left hand. That right hand and left hand is my spy boy, the flag boy. Those are my people in front of me. They protect me. They let no one get close to me when I'm out in the streets. You have to get past these two guys, and these two guys are not going to let you come close to me unless you explain to them that you want to see the chief. They are not going to let you come close. I have queens. I'm about the only chief that have seven queens. Everyone else maybe have one. I have seven, maybe eight, and they're constantly growing. My tribe consists of so many guys. Uh, my wild man, this is a wild man. This is a wild man, he's a wild man. This wild man, and we call him wild man because our past we travel, he clears the way and get out of his way when you see him coming through. He's going to make a pass. Get out of his way. This is the way we come in. And that's our wild man job. We have medicine man. Our tribe is consists of many people. It does different, so many different things. But I'm the chief. I'm the big chief. I'm the big chief. My word is final. Big Chief give the order. Big Chief give the order. It's like when Big Chief won't fire your order, get Chief fire your order. Whatever the Chief order, you must do for the Chief. Being a Chief, man, I'm standing tall right here talking to you guys, and I'm proud to be here. I'm proud to be standing before you, telling you about our culture and who I am and what's my position, and how did I get my position. It's a beautiful culture, and I'll tell you something else about this culture. It's a sociable culture. This culture is about the only culture that will allow you to take pictures with them, to dance with them. You can't get this from a Rex parade or a Vodka parade. You cannot get that out of these people. They don't do that. They don't associate. They don't socialize like that. But we do. We take pictures, we laugh, we drink, we have fun, we dance with you. You're allowed to do that with us. So that's what's so great about our culture. We welcome people in. We welcome you. We welcome you. Being a chief, 
Yes, I'm proud. I'm strong. Now I'll tell you about who I am right now, Victor Harris. I'm the chief of the Mandingo Warriors. The spirit of fight, yeah, yeah. But you see me standing here as who I am today, right now. But when I put on the suit, I'm no longer who you then looking at standing here. That whole, I'm changing. The spirit have taken me. No longer me no more. I do things that I, I could not normally do myself if I'm not in that suit. But when I'm in a suit, I do things that it's not me anymore. Like I said, it's, it's, it's the spirit. It takes me over. It controls me. It leads me. It guides me. It's a good spirit, man. Great spirit. And like I said, it provides for all, everyone. And it's a healing spirit. And I say it again, believe it or not, it's a healing spirit. I have been many places, and many times when I was there, strange things occurred. Many times, many times, strange things occurred when I was when on reservation. Things you would not believe. Things you would say, "Well, he's just talking." That could not be true. On the Mardi Gras morning, there was a guy in a wheelchair. He was stuck to that wheelchair. He was sick. He was on his dying bed. And someone told me to go see him. And he was on the car on the Mardi Gras morning. And I went over to this guy and his head was down, hanging low. No strength whatsoever. And I believe then the, with the, the, the good Lord gave me the power of healing. I put my hand on this guy's shoulders and I shook him. And I shook him. And I shook him. And I said, get up! Get up! Chef! Lo and behold, he stood up out of that wheelchair, throwed his hands in the air, and he started walking, and his mother passed out because she could not believe that. And that's only one of the stories I could tell you, out of the thousands of stories I could tell you, you would not believe that the spirit of fire I have the power to do, have done. And I believe in that. I believe in myself. And there are those who with me, they have seen these things before and still don't believe that I have this certain power that's invested in me. Those who are with me don't believe that. Those who are following me, those who are behind my back, they still doesn't believe it. They don't believe it. But they dare to see it, to witness it. That's why I don't understand some people and sometimes I don't try to understand them because I could understand why and who they are. And once I learned that, I could live with it. I can live with that. <clears throat> That's the power of being a chief, acknowledging everyone, understanding who they are, their attitude, I learned this, I learned that. I learned my people, 
I don't get mad. I don't get ignorant. I don't get crazy. I just keep it within, knowing who they are. Even if they're thinking that I don't know them, I know them better than they know themselves. I don't let everyone know everything that I know. I let them think sometimes that I don't know anything at all. And that's my advantage that I have. And all that is the power of a chief acknowledging all of this. And I'm grateful for being a chief. And believe me, I love serving my people. I am a servant. That's what I do. I serve. I serve. That's what I do. I give. That's what I do. I serve and I give. I don't receive a pot of gold. I receive a blessing from God. That's my reward. I'm not looking for anything from anyone. I have a job. I have a destiny. And I just hope that I can continue serving my Lord. Just hope that I can make my God proud. That's my task. That's my task. But being a chief is being, uh, feeling like I feel right now great. I feel good. I feel like a, a big chief should right now. That's why I'm speaking so fluently, and I'm letting it out, because I am a chief. I can speak as a chief. I, I have authority in my voice, and I speak with authority. And sometimes when I speak with authority, there are those who get mad because they're thinking I'm talking to them bad. But that's the ones who don't have the knowledge and understanding of what I'm saying. I never speak to anyone bad. Never speak to no one bad. I never disrespect anyone. I didn't been disrespected thousands of times. I overlooked that. But there is a range. <laughs> so far, you could come to me disrespecting me. I won't tolerate it in my range. I won't. I'm a warrior as well. I'm a warrior. And to be a chief, you have to be a warrior. You have to be a brave. And that's how I live. I live like a warrior. And I'm going to die like a brave. I have no fear. And I won't bow down because I don't know how. I'm the big chief. I'm the big chief of the nation with a bad, bad, bad reputation. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Are there any questions? Don't be afraid. Please. Jane, come a little closer. Wanna, perhaps with the mic. Thank you. Good morning, Chief Harris. Good morning. Thank, thank you very much for this very powerful speech. You're welcome. I'm, I'm really impressed. Thank you. I have a, a question. Um, could you tell something more about how the spirit of III came to you and how you were um, put in this position as chief? Were you appointed by your former chief? Could yeah. you give a little explanation, please? Okay, okay, excuse me for one minute. Rachel, will you please come up here? Okay. 
because I can't make out too much what you're saying, so let me go on in the booth. Let me know what you said. She's saying, can you um, can you explain um, how the spirit of Yaya Yaya came to you? What why you decided to mask in a mask in African style? Oh. Yeah, good question. <laughs> Okay, here's your answer. Good question. Thank you for asking that question. Oh. You guys gonna have to bear along with me because when I explain this all the time, I get emotional and I want y'all to understand why. Okay. Well, th there was a problem. Uh, some guys had, a guy, a friend of mine had asked me to make a song with him, right? To help background him in making a song. Uh, so I agreed to, okay, yes, I'll help you. And, uh, so that's what we did. And I'm gonna make it short, because the guy who uh, I helped do the song with, his name was Ernest Skipper, he's dead and gone too, God bless him. After the song was made, that was the last time I seen Ernest Skipper. And, and then something uh, wild trouble started. My little brother, he kept coming to me saying, man, they are talking about you real bad out there in the streets. Well, I said, well, why are they talking about me bad in the streets? He said, he said uh, I don't know, but you better go out there and see why they are talking about you the way they are. So I didn't worry about that because sometimes my, my, my little brother drinks a lot, so I thought maybe he might have had too many drinks. But he wouldn't let that go. He wouldn't let it go. And he kept saying, I told you to go out there, they're still talking about you. So I said, well, let me go out there and find out what he's talking about, what they're saying about me. So now I go out there to find out what's happening. Everyone's starting to they're, they're shun away from me. Nobody wants to speak to me. No one in the neighborhood. I'm the chief. I'm the, I'm the chief. Now, suddenly, nobody wants to talk to the chief. No, I'm sorry. I wasn't the chief. I was the spy boy, flag boy. I'm sorry. I was not the chief at the time. I was the flag boy of the yellow Pocahontas at the time. There was no such word. No such thing as spirit of fire, yeah, yeah. It wasn't even out then. And so when I go out there to look for people to find out what was the problem, everyone was avoiding me. All of, them, all of my closest people, too. I went to my chief house and I asked the chief. I said, well, chief, I said, what's the problem? They say I'm out of the tribe. The chief, the chief would always, he would always, <coughs> he would clear his voice all the time. I'd say my chief, before he speak, he would, <coughs> uh, well, they say you did this, you done that. I said, well, what, did, what are you talking about, chief? What did I say? What did I do? He wouldn't tell me. I said, well, they say I'm out of the tribe. I said, hey, what, am I in the tribe? He said, well, they voted you out. I said, well, you're the chief, chief. That was the first time I raised my voice at my chief. And he said, well, I can't do nothing about it. I said, you're the chief. Why can't you do anything? Why can't you do anything about it? He said, because they all voted you out. So I went to look for somebody else, someone else, and asked somebody else. A guy who would always draw my design, in which he was a relative of mine's. And I'm looking for him to get my designs. I can't find him anywhere. Suddenly, no one wants to talk to me. And then when I did find this particular person I'm speaking up on, I asked him, well, where's my design? He said, I cannot do anything for you anymore. I said, man, what? What are you talking about? He said, I cannot do anything for you anymore. I said, well, why? What's the problem? And he was the one that told me, well, you and this guy, you and Coach, a good friend of mine, he's dead and gone too. He said, you, uh, you sold out the tribe. I said, what is you talking about that I sold out the tribe? He said, y'all you, 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 put your name on that record. I said, what record? Well, he was talking about the record that I helped the guy make, right? The background. Now, this guy who took that record, made the record, he ran off with it, and he just happened to do something. He made an honest mistake. He didn't think he was doing anything wrong. What he did was he put the name of the tribe on, on the label. 
He's used their name, but he used their name through me saying, because flag, I'm the flag boy. He said, flag and the bar, the yellow Pocahontas. That was the name of my tribe. And they thought I had something to do with that. And that was the first time I heard of that. I didn't know anything of it. But now here, Here it is, so they put me out of the tribe. Now I'm being with the tribe 20 years, 20 long years, being the most loyal and most respected flag boy in the tribe. And all of my friends and people that have been knowing went to school with my whole entire life. And now all of a sudden, you, they had a, a trial without me being there and they voted me out? Yes, that's what they did. That's what they did. And so now I'm out of a tribe. So I, I never had a chance to explain to them anything. They just voted me out without me being there to defend myself. I was truly out of the tribe. And when you're out of the tribe and they put the word out on you, it was just like, you know, Moses. You know, Moses, you got to leave Egypt. You cannot longer stay here anymore. No different from that. And that's the way it was. And so, man, I'm crying. I'm hurting all inside, not knowing what to do because this is all I did my whole entire life. Mass is a mighty ground, ending in honor my tribe, my neighbor, my community. And to be prosecuted in such a manner without being able to defend myself, that was hurting me more than anything. So now I'm out of a tribe. So Mardi Gras is coming, carnival is coming, and I still want the mass. This guy who I call Left Melvin Reed was my teacher. He was the one who made my designs for me. So now he, no one would do anything for me, nothing. And so one day, or we say one night, I said, you know, I didn't been to everyone. I said, now, I said, I haven't been to God. And, and I said, God, I'm sorry, I haven't come to you yet. That's who I should have went to first. Wasn't thinking clear. So I'm in my house one night. Like you might hear a little humming sound now, like the refrigerator might have been humming. I pulled the plug out of the refrigerator. Oh, it was a ticking sound. So I said, I could hear, I was, my, I was so keen, I could hear everything. A ticking sound with the clock. I stopped the clock from ticking. I pulled the plug from the TV. I didn't want to hear any sound whatsoever, none, no sound. I was home all along, too. And after I got everything in position, I put myself in position. I turned off all of the lights in the house. And then that's when I went to God. Sincerely, truly, I never prayed like this a day in my life. And today, I still haven't prayed like that. And I asked God, but, but the first thing I asked God, well, why? I'm like, if I'm questioning God, like, why? The first thing I say, well, God, why? Why? How could something like this be? How could this happen to me? Lord, you know my feelings. You know what I have done. You know how I served. I say, please, God, talk to me. Tell me. Give me an answer. So... I could get rid of the pain that was in my heart. My whole body was aching. And I asked God, please talk to me. And just as sure as I'm talking to you people out here, that's how I wanted God to speak back. I wanted God to answer me right there, to talk to me personally. And I was looking, hearing, waiting for his voice. I really want to hear his voice. That did not happen. That didn't happen. So I waited and waited for God to say something. He didn't say anything to me. So I started crying. I cried, standing up, and slid all the way down the wall, crying, 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 until I cried myself to sleep. And I cried myself to sleep. I cried. When I woke up that next morning, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling good. I'm saying, I'm saying this. I'm stretching my own when I woke up the next morning. I'm saying, ah, ah, yeah, ah, and I'm feeling the word. I'm feeling the word as I'm flexing. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the word saying, ah, yeah, 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 and I'm listening to that, ah, yeah, yeah, and, I, and it came to me, ah, yeah, fire, fire. 
And the word came to me, and then third time, the third time when I said the word, it came to me. It was the first time the word ever been spoken. The word that is not even in a dictionary today. <laughs> Only I can explain the meaning of that word. The spirit, the fire, yeah, yeah. And the third time I clenched my fist and I squeezed it as tight as I could possibly squeeze it. And I squeezed it, and the third time I yelled it, fire, yeah, yeah. And that's when I became the spirit of fire, yeah, yeah. That's when I first started wearing the mask. That's when I first started. what I call a powerful start. I would like to welcome now uh, Lakisha Simmons and uh, Crescent City Girls Searching for Pleasure in a Racist uh, World. Merci. everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me here. Thank you, Big Chief Harris. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about my research on African American girls in New Orleans. Crescent City Girls Searching for Pleasure in a Racist World. This is a photograph taken at Claiborne Avenue branch of the New Orleans Young Women's Christian Association, the YWCA, on Canal Street sometime in the 1950s. The YWCA was a nonprofit organization that provided spaces, spaces of leisure and education for young women. The New Orleans branches were segregated during this time period, and so the Claiborne Street YWCA focused on black girls only. They weren't allowed at the white YWCA. If we can assign emotions to the bodily characteristics of the girls in this photo, we might say that they look not only happy, but also excited and proud. The girls in the make-believe land photograph give us clues to the function of the colored YWCA. The teenagers did not just pose for the camera, they also created a whole world, a new landscape. Although there's a prearranged symmetry to their positioning, they do not appear stiff because they stand in character. Their costumes, inspired by fairy tales, were only one piece of a larger performance. The princess in the front sits regally with her legs carefully folded so that she can present the ruffles on her dress to the camera. The cross-dressed prince in the back, with mustache and all, stands straight up arms down at the sides, perhaps trying to enact a masculine stance. Fittingly, the prince is also the only person in the photograph not displaying an open smile. Is it the smirk of power that she wears? The camera, it seems, caught the girls in the act of make-believing. Such make-believing supplied pleasure, and the YWCA provided the materials, the stage, and backdrop for make-believe. It was a land of fantasies. My research explores the lives of black girls who grew up in, in New Orleans during a period of state-sponsored racial segregation, a period known as Jim Crow that lasted from about 1877 to about 1964. During this period, white politicians passed laws that forbid African Americans from fully participating in civic and public life. African Americans could not attend white public schools, drink at water fountains, vote, sit on park benches, and much more. In addition, white citizens, private business owners, and white employers were allowed to discriminate against African Americans, 
preventing them from equal access to shops, to doctor's office, to good jobs, and much more. In my book, Crescent City Girls, The Lives of Young Black Women in Segregated New Orleans, I try to tell the story of black girls' experience with the emotional and physical violence of Jim Crow segregation. Among historians and even in the general American public, there's an incomplete understanding of how racial violence functioned in the Jim Crow South. Much of what is known about segregation focuses on black men's experiences of violence, but how did girls experience racial violence? And what were their emotional responses to growing up in a world where they were often told they were not wanted or valued? To better understand how racism and segregation worked in black girls' lives, I had to study the particularities of New Orleans. I learned that space and power went together. I paid attention to where girls lived, worked, went to school, and had fun. I found that the physical placement of buildings revealed black, black youth's relationship to, the, to power in the city. Approaching the question of urban space in this way brings into view lived experiences of segregation through a street by street and neighborhood analysis. Understanding racialized geographies teaches us to note what space is occupied by the colonized, the enslaved, the incarcerated, the disposable. In segregated New Orleans, I studied neighborhoods and analyze black girls' access to safety, to protection, sanitation, and livable conditions. The nature of segregated space differed in each area of New Orleans. Black girls were aware of this as they crisscrossed the city streets. As children navigated the city, their sense of self shifted. Growing up during segregation, Florence Borders discovered that she was colored in the space of urban New Orleans. She traveled across the city and practiced her reading skills. And as she did that, she came to understand the meaning of race. Borders remembered this moment in an oral history interview explaining, one word that I keep that I kept seeing was spelled C-O-L-O-R-E-D. And I was trying to sound out the word and I was saying colored. What is colored? And her dad, he told me, that's colored and it means you. And I was looking at the signs that were marked for my use that looked different from the things that had W-H-I-T-E. And I always wanted to know why those things didn't look as nice. So my father was trying to help me understand the kind of society in which I had to live. And he just told me that no matter what other labels were placed on me, I determined who I was. The letters in the word colored, the sounds they made when strung together, and the quality of those things the letters marked taught Florence Borders complex lessons about her place in Jim Crow society. Border's father simultaneously helped give meaning to the word colored, as he attempted to teach his daughter to see herself as more than the narrow definition that hung from the signs she sounded out. But black girls learned the complexity of racial power in other ways as well. In an autobiographical essay, Growing Out of Shadow, Margaret, Margaret Walker remembers coming to a realization of what it means to be black in America. Walker, who lived in New Orleans as a girl, wrote, before I was 10, I knew what it was to stay off the sidewalk to let a white man pass. Otherwise, he might knock me off. I had had a sound thrashing by white boys while black men looked on helplessly. White boys were known to harass black girls. In 1939, the Louisiana Weekly reported, white boys hit schoolgirl, was on her way home when hit in the face. The Newspaper article that followed is a rare instance where street harassment shows up in the official historical archive. The Weekly reported that neighborhood white boys harassed black girls attending the newly built Claiborne branch of the YWCA. The white boys on the street forced black girls entering the colored YWCA to recognize their power and control over this space. 
The newspaper pointed to the regularity of the attacks and argued that the assaults were motivated by resentment among white residents who did not want the YWCA located on Canal Street. The Claiborne Branch's location toward the lake side of Canal Street helps explain some of the hostility girls faced as they attempted to enter the building. The structure was formerly a black teacher's training school called Straight College. Behind the YWCA, but occupying the same property, was um, Albert Wicker, a junior high school. It was a colored public junior high school. Although these two important black institutions were in the neighborhood, whites populated the houses that bordered them. According to the 1930 and 1940 census, not even one black family lived in the 32 homes that surrounded the property. The whites that lived along the property of the YWCA were working class and middle class whites. They engaged at labor in local factories, worked in white collar jobs as clerks, and they were employed as city firemen, city officials, streetcar drivers, and typists. These are all jobs that were denied to black New Orleanians. There were even white police officers in the neighborhood. Policeman Henry Norton's house was directly across the street from Wicker Junior High School. But the presence of policemen did not provide safety for black girls walking along the street. Indeed, the New Orleans police were notorious for hur hurling insulting epithets at respectable, respectable black women and girls. Black girls not only experienced physical and psychological violence from white boys and men on the city streets, they also quickly learned that they could be victims of vicious attacks. Girls who worked as domestic help in homes had to navigate sexual harassment and abuse from their employers, and girls working as waitresses in restaurants tried to avoid bosses or customers who regularly abused them. Black girls who grew up in Jim Crow New Orleans also learned the stories of other girls who might have been victims of racial violence. Girls growing up in 1930 heard the story of Hattie McRae, a 14-year-old who was killed by an off-duty white police officer. The police officer had been sexually harassing McRae at the restaurant where she worked. Unable to rape her, the police officer killed her instead. Another 14-year-old, Althea Hart, who wrote to the NAACP, a civil rights organization, um, she wrote to them about Mac Hattie McRae's death. Althea Hart is in this photo. Um, she's in the center in the middle row with fur on her coat. Hart argued that, quote, far too many of our people have suffered the same injustices as this girl and the same thing will continue if our people doesn't stand behind us. Hart acknowledged that the victim was but a child and had been annoyed by this man from, for some time. He insulted the girl. Black girls, as we have seen, were constantly harassed and insulted. Hart, by using the word insult, emphasized both the sexual violence and the street harassment experienced by Hattie McRae and other black girls in the segregated South. Hart's letter also demonstrates how black schoolgirls thought and talked about the case. Her emphasis on childhood highlighted the need to fight racist ideas that black children were never innocent. I want to return to the photograph taken at the YWCA's Make Believe Land. In order to suggest that Make Believe and fantasy are productive ways to envision black girls' performances of pleasure. The Make Believe Land photograph is a compelling symbol because of its location on Canal Street in the midst of segregation. When I stare at the photograph, analyzing it, looking for little things, I find smiling faces who stare back at me. Inside the YWCA and in similar spaces that were inside of the black community, black young women enacted a vision of freedom that contradicted the racism outside its doors. This space was organized around pleasure rather than trauma. 
The building became a space for dancing and for parties sponsored and organized by various clubs. Black girls experienced freedom and pleasure in the planning process of the parties. Making costumes, hanging decorations, inviting friends and boyfriends, group work, coming together, creating together, provided the basis for the YWCA's approach to working with girls and young women. The YWCA the YWCA's leaders believe that by working together in clubs or planning events, young women learned that social adjustment and the growth of the individual are all closely related. Further, at parties, girls learned the value of good taste and general refinement. For the girls involved, the YWCA created a sense of belonging. The Jeune Fille Club participated in and helped create the make-believe world of the YWCA. Here's the club here. In the archive at the Amistad Research Center, it's a, a library and archive devoted to black history in, in America and in New Orleans in particular. A series of photographs is dedicated to the activities of this club. Some of these are photographs of girls in various outfits and costumes. Alongside these posed costume photographs are pictures of young women at the YWCA being taught to sew. It is possible, therefore, that the outfits they displayed in the posed photographs were made by the club members themselves. What made the clothes fantastical was that they were, in a sense, useless, because the clothing was most often made for themed parties, which focused on make-believe. In a photograph taken in 1959, we see this fantasy come to life. A couple has been named Carnival Queen and King, and they will rule the night. The girls made decorations, large painted masks, they're hard to see. Oh, you can see one right up at the top. Oversized fans and ribbons flank the walls while perfectly spaced plants border the dance floor. The image created is striking for its symmetry. The couples who surround the king and queen are almost symmetrical except for the fact that the boy-girl pattern is inverted on one side. The couples on the side descend in height the ballerinas on point strike their pose in tandem. Every single detail in the photograph is perfect, but it is clear that the scene is posed. Inexplicably, nobody in the photo is looking at the photographer. Not one boy or girl's gaze is misplaced. It is clear then that this is a make-believe world with every detail worked to perfect precision by the girls involved. As is clear from the history of the YWCA, dancing, balls, dressing up, and parading were central aspects of the pleasure of make-believe. Nothing re represents the performance of make-believe in black girls' lives better than the public pleasure cultures of the New Orleans Mardi Gras and Carnival season. The pleasures of Mardi Gras were represented in fleeting moments of performance, in, da in dancing, masking, attending parties, and catching and throwing. These pleasure cultures are not easily found in an archive, which privilege texts. But scholars of performance have argued that instead of looking at texts or in libraries, our method of analysis should also turn to the repertoire and traditions stored in the body. In this way, black girls' pleasure cultures can be traced through embodied memory, performance, gesture, orality, movement, dance, singing. I think we've already seen a little bit of that today. The parades and balls that young girls attended were replicas of the lavish Mardi Gras festivities celebrated by black New Orleanians throughout the city. For example, um, the Young Men's Illinois Club staged yearly carnival balls for the fashionable set. Of, and they presented teenage girls as their queen and court. 
Such presentations introduced girls into society, marking them as privileged, popular, and stylish. The Young Men's Illinois Club's sixth annual ball in 1932 enacted the scenario of in old Japan on the rooftop of the Pentheon Temple, a center of black social, economic, and cultural activity in New Orleans. In addition to the famous roof rooftop garden, the building housed social halls, auditoriums, and business offices. One visitor commented on the building saying, on the top of the building, there is a roof garden where concerts, moving pictures, and other credible entertainments are given. And altogether, the roof garden is as much of a necessity as it is a no novelty for the proper kind of social pleasure. His emphasis on credible and proper make clear the respectability of the space. It was, therefore, the ideal geography on which to create the scenario for a ball that transported black New Orleanians from the Jim Crow South into an imagined world of old Japan, full of fashion and sophistication. Indeed, the placement of the garden was as far away from the Jim Crow Street as possible. One advertisement for the temple's rooftop garden noted this geography, declaring that it was 200 feet in the air. For the Young Men's Illinois Club's sixth annual ball, the rooftop had been turned into a Japanese garden with cherry blossoms and wisteria carefully placed to transform the space. The lovely little queen was 15-year-old Clyde Engel, who was dressed in white satin and adorned with a rhinestone crown. She gracefully held a large bouquet of white roses. Like the YWCA, the rooftop garden at the temple provided a different sense of place, undoing the racist geography of Jim Crow. As the site for innumerable carnival balls during the season of carnival, black women transformed the rooftop night after night from one party's theme to the next. 15-year-old Clyde Engel's appearance at the ball, being displayed by the young men at the club and waving to the crowd of gowned and tuxedoed party goers, undid the racial sexual domination of space by renaming black female bodies and their capacity for freedom, for pleasure, for regality. The imaginative capacity of in old Japan demonstrates the ways in which black women think, write, and negotiate their surroundings. Indeed, perform their surroundings as place-based critiques. By remaking space, black teens and young women made space for a self momentarily free from the racism of Jim Crow. Remaking space happened and happens in a multitude of moments during Mardi Gras. Sometimes this happened through simple physical gestures and encounters at parades where black girls were often masked, dressed up in costumes ranging from Indians and dolls to characters from books. In Jim Crow New Orleans, black girls carefully navigated the city streets. Their physical comportment was often deferential, hushed, solemn. But in Mardi Gras, masking made way for new gestures and a new relationship to space, allowing for a new make-believe land. Thank you. I believe, I believe we have time for a question. If not, I have one. But, uh, you, you, uh, the, uh, the big, uh, was there a question in the back somewhere? Yeah, please. Okay. I'll ask mine over lunch. Good morning. My name is Floristina Peyton Stewart, and I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, thank you so much for this work that you pre presented. You've actually taught me something, <laughs> and I've been in Mardi Gras my whole life. Um, will your work continue to focus on current um, women in Mardi Gras? Because as we know now, there are some female crews mm -hmm. with Mardi Gras. Will you study that? Good morning. Um, I 
I haven't moved into the current period as much, but people, especially girls, keep asking me to do it. <laughs> um, partially because um, when I was doing my research for my book on um, black girls who grew up during Jim Crow, I thought of it as doing work on elderly women, uh, friends and family who I knew and had talked to. And then after I published my work, a lot of young girls said, oh, I identify with this. And I had thought, you know, Jim Crow is in the past, so this is an old story that we need to know to understand our elders. But then the girls were telling me, no, you know, I feel the same way about the space of the city. I feel left out in certain ways. Um, and so because of the way they identified with it, they kept saying, you should write something about girls now. Um, I haven't yet, but I should. I guess that's the answer. <laughs> Thank you. Alexa, you actually answered my question. So. Thank you. So our next speaker will be Rachel Berlin, the Neighborhood Story Project, University of New Orleans. Rachel. Maybe I'll have some down here just in case. Do I just click to have, Steve, do I just click to have the, oh, there it is, okay. Okay, y'all are very dark out there. <laughs> Bonjour. Um, um, <laughs> Steve, thank you so much for pulling us all together. It's very beautiful. Thank you to Kim um, for also inviting us. And I also want to acknowledge Bruce Sunpai Barnes, who was very on the grounds in New Orleans, helping you know, bring the different components of um, the presentations together and you know, helping with logistics. It was, like Steve said earlier, um, a big team effort. I want to thank Isabel and Sarah Rosu and the whole communication team for helping launch this. Um, and you know, it was, I didn't, when I was planning this talk, I didn't realize that there was so much historical material around memory. Um, Steve had told me it was about, you know, looking at violence and resistance. Um, so I have um, prepared a talk that um, actually is in good conversation around memory. Um, I wanted to um, share um, a more recent history of the curation of um, African American performance traditions in New Orleans that are extremely grassroots, and they're part of um, the way that I learned about museums. Um, so thank you, and, and I'll just get started. I'd like to dedicate my talk to the two mentors I've had in museum curation and museum studies. Uh, for Sylvester Francis and Ronald W. Lewis, who both created community-based museums dedicated to African-American performance traditions in New Orleans. Sylvester had the Backstreet Cultural Museum and Ronald had um, the House of Dance and Feathers. Ronald passed away in March of 2020, right at the beginning of COVID. He passed away from the, from the virus and Sylvester left us a few months later after a long-term illness. Um, oh, actually, I might, could I grab the books real quickly? Um, so we, over the years, um, I've created the Neighborhood Story Project. My organization has created a number of 
large-scale ethnography projects. And the two that I'm going to highlight today are the two I did with the museums. One is Fire in the Hole. You saw a photograph of that um, during Victor's presentation, and, and then the catalog for the House of Dance and Feathers. Um, the Neighborhood Story Project you know, is kind of an unusual organization in the sense that it's a, um, a, a nonprofit that's a, uh, in partnership with the university, and we create um, books and exhibits and um, programs with our community partners. Um, and while I've presented this work many times uh, in anthropology conferences, this is the first time I've presented it in a museum context. And then as I was putting it together, I was just thinking about how fascinated Ronald and Sylvester would be to be here at the Cape Ronley, um, just looking at the collections, the curators, um, um, approach to the presentation of the material, and um, you know, in, in this conversation. Uh, so drawing from the work that I've done with them, I'm going to quote them extensively throughout the talk so you can hear their own voices. Uh, Ronald had told me years ago, one of the th greatest things I learned from the Mardi Gras Indian culture was to get to know the person out of that costume. Get to know him as an individual. When you see a photo of mine, I usually know the stories behind the suits. It's the same with the parade photos. I could tell you about each club. Over the years, I wanted to know the people, not just the parade, the organizations. Who was the president? We got to know each other on a personal basis, and this is how I try to run my museum, too. I get to know the photographers and the people in the pictures. Following Ronald's lead, um, in the presentation, I also wanted to highlight the role that Victor um, has played in the development of the movement to curate Mardi Gras Indian traditions. Um, in the African American community, there's this beautiful ethic of the call and response. Uh, a preacher cannot continue preaching if her congregation does not sing out an amen. In a similar dynamic, the grassroots traditions of museum making means that a curator cannot begin a museum or an ethnography project without the blessing of the community being represented. When Sylvester said that he wanted to create a museum, it was Victor who first donated suits to help build the collection. So here's a, a photo of them. Um, Sylvester in the front, Ronald to the right, and then um, Big Queen um, Kim Bute of the um, Fayaya, on, who passed away of um, a random act of gun violence during COVID. My journey into the ethic of museum curation began when I met Ronald after Hurricane Katrina. He attended a conference I helped organize that brought together artists, architects, urban planners, community organizers, and cultural workers to Im imagine a new, um, how we would rebuild our communities. Uh, Ronald lived in a downriver neighborhood called the Lower Ninth Ward. He grew up in a working class black community where most residents owned their own homes. During 1965, it flooded during Hurricane Betsy, and it flooded terribly during Hurricane Katrina, when the storm surge broke the levee at the Industrial Canal. One of his neighbors, Walter Carter, stayed for the storm and recalls, we heard an explosion twice, boom, boom. That's when the wall of the levee broke loose. The water got high and flooded the neighborhood. A barge came through with the surge of water and it just took houses out. I was on the roof by my friend's house and I saw a house go down North Roman Street like it had a motor on it. Yes, with people on the roof. People were um, called out to me, Papa, we don't know where we're gonna end up at. I was saying, we're just praying, hoping you stay safe. Ronald's house and museum did not float away, but they were completely flooded. On the building in this photo here, you can see a flood line. That's what we call the, um, the edge of where the water eventually settled before they, they pumped the water out. Uh, 
When I asked Ronald what his inspiration for starting his museum was, he said, I was at the point in my life where, okay, I can make a Mardi Gras Indian costume, but I want to educate the world about our great culture, how we do this, and why we are so successful at it, even though the economics says we're not supposed to be. For years, I had heard people la label us, quote, poor, poor blacks because of our economics not fitting into the status quo. Um, and the first thing that they want to signify uh, is our economics instead of looking at our creativity. Ronald worked as a streetcar on the streetcar lines for 30 years and helped organize the union. He believed in collective action. He cited two local inspirations for his museum, the House of Dance and Feathers, the Back Street, and also an organization called Tambourine and Fan. Tambourine and Fan was a cultural organization that was founded by two civil rights organizers in the 1970s named Jerome Smith and Rudy Lombard. And these images that you'll see in the next few slides come from the scrapbooks of Jerome Smith that he let us use for another book project Bruce and I did called Talk That Music Talk. Jerome was raised in the Treme neighborhood and wanted to build on the strengths of his community when he, he said, I started associating activities, oh, oh sorry, let me see, yeah. I'm trying to organize the two slides at the same time, okay. Um, I started associating activities that were like emotional tattoos on people and came up with the name tambourine and fan. The tambourine symbolizes Mardi Gras Indians and the fan is that artifact popularized in the street parade, but both connected to the church and to spirituality. My thing was throughout my life, there was always someone lifting me up. Our kids are going to stumble. We've got to build wagons around them and help them get up again. I wanted to create an organization out of children's play and civil rights, use their fun time for social awareness, historical linkages, especially to the music. I wanted the organization to create a world that would electrify their senses, electrify their spirits. Rome had grown up watching the yellow Pocahontas, so you just heard Victor talk about Tutti Montana, and this is him parading. He experienced both the power and the danger of the streets. He told us a story. One carnival, this white woman came to see our gang with her family. She was a tourist, and she had not, not seen the, anything uh, before about the black Indians. She was out there with her family when we came down our dirt road in the seventh ward called New Orleans Street. I don't know how she found us because the blocks were tight in there. She may have caught the sound of the tambourines. She jumped out of the car and went hollering to her children, come see. To this day, I still remember what she said, oh my God, this is like a devastating beauty. Now that's the reaction you want, understand? But the people came when they saw, the police came when they saw the white woman. They went to put the dogs on Tootie. And then she went to screaming and crying, oh no, don't do that. It was a long time before I got into the civil rights movement. A man she I was with intervened and they pulled the dogs back. All those years, the moment stayed in my head. Tambourine and Fan created a safe space for young people to parade and express themselves. Jerome called it a moving classroom. He also invited different Mardi Gras Indian tribes to parade with them to showcase their work for the year. In the 1960s and 70s, the different tribes gathered together for balls and dances, but they did not have other public events where they shared their collective work. Super Sunday was the first time they all agreed to do it. Sylvester Francis brought out his Super 8 camera and filmed the parades. So this is Sylvester with Ronald um, in the picture up there. Uh, it was a community where many Men worked on costumes for Mardi Gras all year long, but Sylvester became known as a cameraman. 
He explains, I didn't even sew. I think I was born to be a cameraman. In 1970, I started taking movies with Super 8 cameras. Rhodes Funeral Home, where I was working, helped me pay for the film. At the time, you had very few black cameramen, not on Carnival Day. My job was to take pictures, not knowing that you would be calling it documenting. Truthfully, we were just doing it for us, but people started looking for me. These are some still images from um, the first year that Victor came out as Fayyab, and they're from um, a Super 8 camera th from Sylvester. Um, and then he, over the years, you know, Sylvester went back again and again to be able to document Victor's suits. Uh, and this is how he, he talks about starting the museum. Me, I don't know how to sew, but I caught myself helping. My hands were bleeding from the needle over at Victor's house. I didn't know how to do, not to push too hard. I was doing small stuff, but I didn't sleep all night. I was living on Frenchman Street, and Victor was going to come out around the corner on a net. I asked my wife, Lulu, if she had everything set up with my cameras. Did she have the batteries, the tapes? She said yes, but when I got home, I fell asleep. I woke up. Carnival was over. The next day, Victor and them talked about who they had met, what they did, but I saw no, saw no carnival for the first time in my life. I went by his house afterwards, and just like all the other years, the blue suit was thrown in the yard with a little dog back there just wagging its tail. I asked Victor, can I have that piece of the mask, the one that I had helped sew? I felt like I had paid for it a little bit. He told me, yeah, it looked, I looked at it and I hung it up at my house. Every day, guys from other tribes came by to play pool in my garage. And, uh, and they would, what they would do is they'd come, you know, talk shit and, uh, you know, talk stories about what happened. And people started giving him more and more things to add to what Victor had originally given. Um, but it, and this was the beginning of the Backstreet Cultural Museum. And this is what it looked like um, when it was in Treme. This is um, Victor coming out on back, at the back street. So it was this, again, this call and response between the curation and, um, and, and the performances. You know, what we just were listening to the last beautiful presentation about um, the archive and the repertoire. They're happening all the time uh, at the back street. Ronald includes Sylvester in a long line of mentors on the tradition of masking that led back to his own childhood. When he was young, he learned to sew from his friend, whose father was a craftsman and the spy boy for the yellow Pocahontas. He explains, from my start in middle school, the urge just heightened about Mardi Gras Indian culture. It had a mystique to it, a curiosity. Walter Cook Sr., who had the greatest stories about making suits, told us, do your best, and then when that day comes, wear your suit and don't worry about what you didn't get done. You know, I think about that with museum curation, books, everything creative. You know, you can, this is the best we can do at this time. Let's bring it out into the world and not hold back. Ronald says, I was like a kid in a candy store, just observing everything that he had to offer. As Ronald created his museum, he focused on the deep friendships he formed in the creative practices of his neighborhood, in music, in sewing, um, this is the tribe he started, the Choctaw Hunters, which is named after a little street in New Orleans. This is uh, Walter Cook's Creole Wild West tribe. It's Ronald and um, his son Rashad with a suit that he helped sew. And this is the organization they started um, in the Lower Ninth Ward, the Big Nine. It was the first social and pleasure club in the Ninth Ward. You can see they've got the nines on. 
uh, in honor of their community. Um, in 2005, this is what the neighborhood looked like when it was um, right after the storm, because the, like uh, Walter was saying in that quote, the, um, the levee broke and the whole neighborhood had like a tsunami of, of water that crashed into it. Um, Ronald's house was rebuilt by a group of architecture students um, from the University of Kansas um, that he met when he went to that original conference. And he's been working with young people ever since. You know, um, they rebuilt his house as well as the museum. You can see them working on both right here. This is a drawing that um, some of the students did in honor of their summer together in um, 2006. And because the whole neighborhood had been wiped out, Ronald's space really became uh, a port of entry to the neighborhood as people were trying to figure out a way to get back home as well. And then all the media, and um, you can only imagine how many people were coming through, volunteers everybody trying to figure out whether the community could be rebuilt. This is what it looked like when it was um, fully finished. And this is Ronald working on another um, parade, getting ready. He would use it to uh, you know, showcase the culture, but also as a workshop space to be able to create Um, it was part of what I ended up doing the, the few years afterwards was help him um, document what was being donated and turn it into a book. I asked him about this pair of shoes and he said that Daryl Keyes, who's the second chief of the Comanche hunters from the Lower Nine, donated the pair of shoes that he wore during the first carnival back in Mardi Gras 2006. You know, there was a lot of conversation about whether we we should have carnival. You know, was that an indulgent, terrible thing to do when so many people were hurting and far away? Um, but, you know, m for many people, carnival, like you heard with Victor talking, is uh, a celebration of the spirit and a way of, you know, getting your, your nerve up to come back home and take care of all the practical things that let, you know, were in front of us. This is what the suit that Daryl wore that year. Um, and this is, uh, I asked Daryl like, why he decided to donate the shoes to the museum and he said, the Comanche Hunters was the first gang from the Lower Nine to mask after Katrina. It was just me, my two cousins, and two little queens. They were living in FEMA trailers. These were like these very small mobile homes that the government gave to people to live in while they were rebuilding their home. Um, we said, we're gonna all chip in and do it. Most people weren't gonna mask or come back for carnival because they had lost their homes. Why mask? I decided to do it for the people. While everyone was in Texas and all over the world, I was sitting at my home sewing. A lot of my patches, brooches, and material in my attic never got wet from the storm. They were dirty, but salvageable. When I saw the patch of my old boots, I felt like I wanted to make a new pair. But then I said, no, I'm gonna let people see the dirt. They survived the storm. The original boots were blue, but I took patches off and chose red material for the people who had died in the storm. The day we paraded, we went back to the lower nine. We said a prayer by the barge that broke through the levee, and then we started walking up Claiborne to St. Claude Bridge singing two songs that we made up, Busted Levee and How You Gonna Cross the Water. You got to cross the bridge to get to and from our neighborhood. A lot of people were sitting on that bridge during the storm and they had no food, no water. The bridge was up so they couldn't cross. The day I walked through the Ninth Ward across the bridge all the way to Shakespeare Park 
in the muddy shoes that went through Katrina, I felt like nothing could stop me. If Katrina couldn't stop these shoes, nothing could. I wanted to donate those. A patch is something that you wear on your body, but the shoes walking through the Ninth Ward means a lot. Um, as, as Ronald started to develop more of his collection, he, um, people were coming from all over the world. They were making these diasporic uh, connections, not just the neighborhood ones, but uh, you know, how did these traditions connect to other um, parts of the world? This is something similar to what's occurred on a much larger scale here at the Cape Bronley. So I just wanted to share his exhibit of the Middle Passage um, and give you a little description of, of his, what he calls Pan-Africanism. I decided to use boats and masks and, figure and figurines to show connections across places. The masks represent West African culture and the boats represent the slave ships that brought us here. In the middle, I put an Aunt Jemima doll with its image of racism. It's easy to just push history to the side, but I don't want to do that because it's there. To be fair, I want to identify with it all. When I talk to, about my mama coming off the sugar cane plantations, I'm not ashamed of it because that's where my roots are. As I was growing up, my mama always had her hair tied up in a scarf. When I see this doll, I remember that too, and I think about how my family survived those cane fields. It's a little bit of a blurry image here, but um, as we started working on the book, we reached out to African art curators around the world <laughs> and asked them if they would contribute images to help him tell this broader story. So you can see them in the book, but this is a, a procession in Ghana. And this is a Rara parade in Haiti. These are just a few images from our book release party at the House of Dance and Feathers when the book came out. This is Walter Cook dancing with the brass band. Um, and here's Ronald and Victor uh, with a copy of the book. This was a, a gateway. I didn't know that I was going to spend the next decade with Fayaya, <laughs> but that's often how books happen and projects build on each other. Um, I thought y'all would like to see a few photos um, of Victor that first year with Fayaya. This is a long time ago in 1984, but his first suit was black with the spirit of Fayaya. We worked with the Historic New Orleans collection um, to repatriate these images that were in their museum um, reading room to the book so that they could go back into the stories of the community. Um, the, the photographs that you saw in Victor's talk came from an ethnographer named Jeffrey Aaron Reich, who was there, um, the Bayayas official photographer for many years and in the anthropology department at UNO with me. And uh, Jeffrey asked me, he's like, you know, I know you did the House of Dance and Feathers just came out. Would you be interested in doing a book with Fayaya? Because I've been documenting them for, you know, many, many years. And I said, yes, if they can also document you. So it should, and so they, they did a really wonderful interview with Jeffrey about the role of ethnography um, in the culture making. You know, we know that a lot of um, early ethnography books have been used by traditional cultures to like reclaim knowledges that have been lost through colonization. Um, there's a, you know, but ethnography is complicated. We, we must acknowledge it. You know, it, it, the reciprocity is uh, something that is often lost in our discipline. Um, and so the Neighborhood Story Projects really tried to have that kind of call and response and co-creativity. So some of these are the images um, from the book project we did with Victor and Jeffrey. And because um, 
Sylvester at the Backstreet had been co-producing events with Vayaya for so many years, we felt that we also needed to honor the museum and this kind of um, way of the archive and the repertoire supporting each other. So this, this is just like a, a route sheet, uh, is what we call it, where it's just a, a, a flyer that's given out that tells you where to go for the parade um, that Sylvester put together in honor of one of Victor's anniversary years. Here's his drum section for the Mendingo Warriors with Coach, who he's mentioning on the left, and Jack, who's his master designer in the middle, and Wesley, uh, who r runs the drum section on the, the right. And these are a few uh, <laughs> photographs from our book release. We, um, of course, had to have a parade for our book release because of, you know, the way that we celebrate in New Orleans. Sylvester made these sticks uh, with an image of every single year that Victor had paraded, and people held them as we paraded from the original house of on Annette Street, where he um, came out as Fayaya to the museum. Here he is with me and Bruce, and the, on the, the st uh, porch of the back street was uh, a stage for many, many events. And then Ronald and um, Victor together with the, Victor's book. This is Sylvester inside the museum. Uh, when they passed away, Bruce and I produced uh, an All Saints Day event at the back street. So this is uh, our altar dedicated to, to them. Um, and um, on the left is Victor's tribute to, uh, that came out that day, um, and his queen um, who took, uh, you know, she was the voodoo baby doll queen, Risa uh, Bazile, for many years, but when we lost Kim, she had to take over the position of big queen, which is a, a very large role to fill. She did it with a lot of grace and compassion. Um, and then this, I thought we just share a few photographs of a project that we're working on now with Bayaya um, and a Congolese filmmaker and musician named Baloji. He um, asked us to commission Fayaya to, and so, so it was Victor and Jack, who's way up at the top of the um, theater right now, um, to create six suits for the um, film that he was shooting in Kinshasa. And Bruce and I brought them in April to the city for the, it's the first time a, a film had been shot in Congo in over 20 years. I wonder if you, can you do a, a video here? Yes, but I'm not sure if it, you can see the, so this is um, Congolese theater um, performers figuring out how to dance in the suits in a, in a new way. I, 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 don't, I wish we had the, there's no way to do the sound. Okay, let's, we'll skip it. But it's cool, there's like a, a Congolese brass band music that they're dancing to. Here's a little a shot of um, the shooting of the film. And finally, I just wanted to say that um, the back street has moved to a new location uh, and it's still open. And this uh, fall I've been working with uh, Ronald's wife to be able to put to the House of Dance and Feathers back together. You know, just in two years, a collection can really get a lot of damage if you don't take, if you aren't able to take care of it on a regular basis. It's a huge time commitment and to be able to take care of material culture. So my students in my New Orleans public culture class who are in the middle are helping me um, be able to uh, clean everything up and make the repairs 
so that we can reopen hopefully in December. So thank you. We can take a question perhaps in the back. Good morning. There we go. Uh, Rachel, uh, I know you've already uh, moved away from your PowerPoint, but uh, could you uh, express that uh, the Indians, all the beadwork and, and everything, I want to make sure that that's communicated, that every single bead, every patch is sewn. And then if you could go back to uh, the Jerome Smith uh, the Woolworth picture and speak on the fact that that was him being arrested for, as a, as a freedom writer, being uh, arrested for integrating the Woolworth counter on Canal Street. Yes, yeah, sorry, I can't get to the PowerPoint, so someone else up in the technology zone will have to return to it. But yes, yeah, so Jerome Smith, um, was a part of an organization that he co-founded called the Congress of Racial Equality um, in New Orleans. It was a national organization, but the one in New Orleans was extremely active and participated in the freedom rides around Mississippi to integrate the, um, the, the bus stations. And um, he, uh, did, was part of a, many, many sit-ins. He, like in Macomb, Mississippi, he was beaten very badly um, and had to be taken to the hospitals. He really went through a, a huge amount of struggles to, um, for, you know, ending the, the, the Jim Crow era in New Orleans and in the American South. Uh, and he's, he saw the, um, the great dedication and devotion of the um, Mardi Gras Indian culture as a form of resistance to this structure, which of, of course goes with a lot of, um, do I go back? So just as an example, like these, um, are, are circles with beads around them. Jack and, and Victor sewed all those beads down around the rhinestones, and then they used those to build out what you see the men wearing on the other, uh, in, in the suits themselves. So it's extremely time consuming. Um, yeah, each, you can see the way that they do it. Um, and, you know, Victor can talk to you all more about it, and Jack as well, but you, you can see where the rhinestones are now and the circles of beads around them. Each one of those just starts with a circle that you saw previously. And then here's another good example. all the intensive beadwork that goes into each of the suits. And so, and one of the things that was um, shocking to Sylvester as a non-sewer was just that afterwards, there wasn't a place that many people kept the costumes to d display them. You know, it was a, about friendship and community in the moment and the, in the creative process itself. They weren't thinking so much about long-term curation. Uh, and so Sylvester was one of the, f maybe the first to say, no, like there's so much work and creativity goes into this. We need to honor that part too. Uh, yes. That's the seed beads. It's a, a different style that a lot of the lower nine Indians use. Yeah, so um, this is curriculum 
I'm sorry I passed over it a little fast, um, that Jerome created for the students in tambourine and fan. Um, they, they would print these out and give them as their own curriculum f for the young people on the after, after school programs and on the weekends. They would learn about the civil rights struggles. And then, um, I think it's, maybe that, did that image not get in? Oh, yeah, this is another one that I love. They would create parades, um, but we are nice, but we read, write, and fight. You know, it's not just about dancing, it's about the resistance um, as well. Well, thank you very much, merci beaucoup. <laughs> J'invite Philippe Charlier, qui va nous parler de la tradition africaine Bénin, Togo, Nigeria, de la danse des morts et des esprits, Egungun, Gelede et Zangbeto. Merci beaucoup, Steve. Thank you very much, Steve. Je vais faire ma communication en français, si vous I'm going to speak in French, if you don't mind. It's so beautiful, but it's better for you to be translated than speaking directly into English. Um, Rachel, vient de nous parler Rachel just talked to us about how important ethnography, ethnology was to better understand where you come from, where your roots are, where these amazing traditions are come, uh, coming from the tradition of black Indians. What I would like to do today is maybe to act as archaeologists and try and look for the roots of black Indians from an archaeology, from an anthropological viewpoint. Where do these traditions come from? Where are they coming from? What were they before they crossed the Atlantic during the slave trade? How did the gods travel on the shoulders of the slaves? And how was this tradition experienced back there. We are going to try and look for the original form of Fayaya, Big Chief was talking about earlier on. I'm sorry, I may have made a mistake with my remote. This is the first tradition that we are interested in. The Igungun are spirits of the dead belonging to the Yoruba tradition. This is a people that is very well known and has been extensively described and comes from mostly Nigeria, but uh, also traveled to Benin and Togo. We also find them in Porto Novo, the capital city of Benin and Kutu. The Egunguns are the uh, sparkling uh, manifestation of local spirits they have colors, pearls, curries, and a mix of extremely bright colors and very colored, multi-hued, which is a, a manifestation of the power of the dead and of the spirits. Dead is not seen as an end. The ghosts always imbue these costumes and help teach knowledge from one generation to the next. Unfortunately, this picture is in black and white and makes it quite difficult to uh, imagine the uh, colorfulness of uh, the costumes. But this is also uh, a way for us to imagine the dances that have been transmitted from Africa right down to uh, black Indians. These are parts of uh, Western African voodoo traditions. It is often said that the costumes are empty, that the spirit of the dead, that uh, the spirits of the elite, of ghosts, those who have something to say, since there is a hierarchy within the dead, which uh, translates uh, is the translation of the hierarchy within the living, and that the spirit will use this, the costume as a way to move into the world 
you know that uh, there is always an ezo and exoteric version of such traditions. This is how you see how we exp how they experience costumes among Egunguns. There are high-ranking initiated uh, elders which are going to use the costume while entering into a trance. This is very similar to what Big Chief Harris was telling us. For him, these are the spirits of Fayaya, and for the Egungun, we're talking about spirits. The people, the dead, uh, uh, figures in case of a party, in case of a major disaster, in case of any important event, will act on behalf of the living because the living do not have the needed power to restore order to the world. The spirits are seen as a way to restore order. You can see one uh, here, uh, photographed on this beautiful picture by Pierre Verger. This is a, another version. This is a painting that shows how old this tradition is, and it's been documented at least since the 18th century. Rachel, earlier on, was showing the two small shoes, the multi-huge shoes of a big chief costume. Here, there are similar shoes. The style is very similar. In, such, in such costumes, almost no part of the body is visible. The purpose of such costumes is to hide the human being that is hiding underneath. We want to make sure that the extra human, the over human spirit is completely taking over the human being that is hiding in, under the costume. You also understand how thin this limitation, this uh, border between uh, the living and the dead is. This is a small costume probably used for children of course, costumes increase in size as the uh, initiated increase in size, but this goes to show that children are not excluded from uh, such uh, uh, cults as evidenced by the uh, story that uh, Big Chief told us. Children have a place, a, pl a role to play within such parades, and they evolve and they grow up as their costumes evolve and grow as they do. Faces and masks, either square, shaped, or covered with wooden masks, which brings us back to another social secret society called the Gelede. But what matters here is that the face is not visible. You can hardly guess that a human being is hiding under this. Only very small holes are made, drilled in the mask as a way to hide humanity. There's a, a very small window that has been opened between the inside and the outside. The kori, which used to be a, a currency in Western Africa, is also used as a sign that this costume has been used and has been chosen by the gods. It is a sacred costume. It's also a sign of wealth, spiritual and physical wealth. You can see here a detail on the face of this Egungun. The different lines of Kori that imitates the scarifications that are often found on the faces of the Yoruba population. And there are three additional lines uh, of fetish, of additional protection, as a way to add one more interface between the world of the dead and the world of the living. This mask is, should be seen as a magical border 
Why? Because it is dangerous to move from the living, uh, the world of the living to the world of the dead. If you get too close to this border as a human being, there is a risk that you might be drawn and fall on the other side. It is quite interesting to look at the style of uh, such costumes. Uh, we recently uh, uh, were saddened by the death of uh, Queen Elizabeth. You can see here that uh, they are part of the uh, patterns as a sign of prestige. The use of the image, visit of the faces of queens and kings and emperors comforts a high prestige over the people who wear such costumes. Encore un autre, voyez, et celui-ci figure en plus d'autres choses. This is something that uh, gives us another clue to what we are looking at. You can see here that no part of the physical body is visible. You can also see that there is an idea of what the face should look like at the top of the costumes. There is a, a notion of uh, a life here, and there are uh, three small pointy uh, bits on the mask. They express a sense of danger. In other words, should you get too close, you might be stung by death itself. The face of the human being becomes danger. There are also a number of insects that are engraved onto the uh, costume. Why? Well, number one, because uh, they are family uh, emblems. They represent specific individuals. Number two, because they represent the different types of insects that will appear on a dead body and therefore as such, they are emblems of death. You can see here the three pointy bits, especially the one that is close to what should be the nose of the person wearing the costume, and it is a clear sign that people should not get close. This also reminds us of scorpions, which are deadly animals when they decide to stung. Here is a more simple a more down-to-earth costumes, which is very typical of the Egungun. These are heavy costumes. They can weight up to 30 to 40 kilos. They are difficult to move into. They are not sewed onto the individual, but one and then closed around the body of the person who wears it. Here, the head of the person who wears it is surmounted by the face and body of and the ancestor. Here are a couple of Egungun as photograph, photographed by Léonce Raphael Abgojelu, a series of photography purchased by the museum. Of course, these are staged pictures, but uh, they uh, have the benefit of showing the Egungun whilst in movement. This is uh, another picture of a... Uh, character and this next one looks almost like an Instagram picture, doesn't it? If you want to see the living version, if you, don't, if you want to see the Igunguns whilst moving, then you need to go away from the main city. You need to try and look for them at the time of transition that is the end of the day and all beginning of the day. Or especially around dusk or dawn. This is a time when people do not know whether they are dead or alive. They are experiencing a moment of doubt. The Egungun travel together in groups, preceded by drumming that would warn inhabitants of their arrival. 
Such masquerades are start calmly. Egunguns are there to be seen and introduced, and then they start dancing, usually starting in a couple. They will shout at each other, they will haggle each other in a play that becomes increasingly uh, cathartic. It is also an opportunity to exercise, to create links, to bond the community together. And very often hubris is such that the dead becomes uncontrollable. That's when they need to leave. In the meantime, they are, in inter they are uh, interacting with uh, the community of the living. They will also demonstrate uh, how flexible they are. Extending their costume and then folding it again and running towards human beings. Look at this Egungun. You don't even know where the head starts and where the costume finishes. Actually, the head is right here. The head is a fake one. There is a fake uh, honorable arm and there is a number of uh, there is signage here with an animal looking like a crocodile, a cobra, a snake, different uh, animals that uh, are representative of the uh, individual. You can see here a whole family here. It's one of the most important important of uh, the most significant Egungun. There is a very significant uh, sign here which is placed right in front of the heart, which is a key area to place symbols. After a while, the vaticination uh, takes place. In other words, this is where the truth is being told. This is where the past, the present and the future are revealed. The glass between wrong and right is shattered. The border, the walls that prevent truth from being told is, being, is broken down. Everyone bows as a sign of respect and to make sure that nobody hears what the Egungun has to say. The initiated usually bows bows a little bit more, they should be more respectful than the character that we see here on the picture. They should actually put their knees on the floor. In the same way as what uh, Big Chief was saying, this is something that I found very impressive. When he said, I am the Big Chief, he expressed both a spiritual and um, down-to-earth uh, pride. In reality, when faced with the Gungun, you need to kneel in order to hear the truth, as evidenced in this picture. The most important item it's, uh, is the artifact that you can see here that is held by a low-ranking initiated. And again, this artifact, this baton, is a representation of the wall between the living and the dead. If a kid or a an adult should touch this baton, this stick, they might die. And this dead could take place either in reality or spirituality. The person would then faint or would be pushed aside and then would be carried to the closest Egungun convent and woken up in the harshest way. They would also be reminded that they uh, lacked respect to the Egungun and that they might risk even worse punishment should they take, do this again. Here you can see the young, low-ranking associate holding the stick as a way to show the difference. You can see here that only four centimeters separate the face of the uh, initiated and the Kuris. This is the four centimeters that separate death from life. Egungun exists not only in Benin, Togo and Nigeria. You can also find Egungun on the other side of the Atlantic, here in Bahia, in Brazil. You can see here an Egungun, which was photographed by Pierre Verger. And as you can see, from a stylish viewpoint, and also from the way he moves, the way he acts, 
is very similar to the one that we just saw on the other side of the Atlantic. The gods traveled on the shoulders of the slaves. We could also find similar attitude and similar costumes with big chiefs. The second tradition I wanted to talk about were Gelede. They're, always, they're also a masquerade taking place among the Yoruba. However, they are not meant to, to um, convey, to conjure up um, spirits, but they are a reminder of the fact that the Yoruba society used to be matriarchal as a way to re-establish the power of women to compensate for their loss of power, female women who are both birth givers and uh, witches have found a way to compensate for this loss of power with Gilede. Whenever an accident takes place, whenever a, hur a hurricane, a uh, earthquake, when a revolution takes place, when a bus um, accident takes place, we need to, to make sure that chaos is fought, that the mother goddess, that uh, the, the earth and the anger of the uh, goddess uh, is quite the costume is always worn on top of the uh, skull and sometimes in front of the body you can see here a few examples photographed on postcards that uh, I found here in the collections of the Quebranli Museum. You can see here that they are not subhuman, over, they're not larger than a normal uh, human being. These ones come from the region of Ketou. And they were enormously successful up to Grand Popo next to uh, the Togo border. We also find them in Ouida and mostly in the Porto Novo, Cotonou and around the coastal areas. You can see here another example. And here are the masks as they are worn. You can see again the scars of the, uh, the, the faces that are scarred. You can also see these uh, typical uh, eyes, eye-shaped, and again the holes that have been drilled inside the eyes are not necessary since they are worn on top of the head. This is a highly elaborate mask with a bird biting a snake, which goes back to traditional tales within the Yoruba culture. I also talked to you about masquerades. Masquerades are part and parcel of this tradition. You can see here a pair of boots as a way to represent, to illustrate the fact that an event took place in the past year that involved a, either a person wearing boots or a boot maker. Here you can see a number of people who looks like a boat or maybe a large uh, uh, a large bucket. Here you can see a young a woman who is carrying a basket. Again, the Gelede will wear this mask on top of her head, and the top of the mask is itself uh, decorated with another individual. So it's very much like wearing a whole, uh, a whole uh, family tree. Here you can see a white man were sitting on his chair. And what I believed was a, a woman giving birth, but it's actually not the case. And I will leave this to your imagination. Some masks are very old. You can see this: the face of this character is uh, covered in scars. It's been identified as a Gilege mask. The mouth and uh, eye shapes are very different from what we have seen so far. 
classiquement. Before I move to the Zangbeto, I would like to stress how cathartic the Gelede masquerades are. This is a time for the community to be together, but this is also a time to reveal new uh, technological evolutions such as uh, bicycles, um, motorbikes, computers, even though the rituals are consistent, the evolution of technology is something that you can see with your own eyes as you move from one generation to the next. The last masquerade I wanted to talk about was the Zangbeto masquerade. They are very different from what we have seen in the Yoruba. They are uh, from the Fon, uh, and Benin, and central Benin, as well as Togo. The Zangbeto are not masks as such, not in the burlesque meaning of the word, but they are part of a social society whose purpose was to act as night police, maintaining land and order. There is in Porto Novo, there is a, a large temple, a Zangbeto temple, where uh, masks are displayed. The costumes are 2 or 2.5 meter high with green leaves and grass that are going to increasingly turn into dry, dry grass. The purpose of the Zangbeto is to make sure that women and children have uh, gone back home, that no young man is um, running amok, uh, drunk, they, their purpose is to maintain law and order. They act as police. They are also very uh, pale colored, meaning that they can be seen from far away. They also turn and the parts of the costume that fly away tend to fall on people as a way uh, to uh, express, to, to protect them. My question to Big Chief would be, and I would be very interested in knowing that, in knowing that should a feather fall from the costume, does it mean that, it, uh, that the, the feather is recovered uh, as a sacred object, or can people keep them? The Zangbeto tradition is something that is deeply part and parcel of the children's education. There are small uh, dolls, Zangbeto dolls, that help children understand from a very early age what the Zangbeto do. Zangbeto is a spirit, not a spirit of the dead, but a spirit of a god acting as a vigilante. The spirit is never very far. Let me get back to this, to this uh, picture. What sometimes happened would be that uh, the uh, Zangbeto would roll, roll around, turn around, turn around, turn around, and fall on its side and nothing would be, uh, there would be nothing inside. And sometimes a small hen would walk away, sometimes a small spirit, sometimes a small fire starts. This is to show that you have moved from the uh, realm of the dead to the realm of the gods. Similarly, a Zangbeto initiated member will hide within the inside of the straw. I'm not going to uh, violate any secret. This is another doll used with and by children as a way to make them understand the role of uh, the Zangbeto. Zangbeto. I find that there's a similarity with the Halloween dolls. I could have talked to you about the Zach Pata uh, initiated. When I was initiated to voodoo about 15 years ago, this was part of the, of the ceremony. Men wear very colorful skirts and dresses. The chief of the uh, Zangbeto uh, community wears a stick, the stick that I'm holding here. You can see here that uh, it's similar to some of the big chiefs and black Indians that we saw earlier on wearing similar uh, sticks. 
important dans le vaudou béninois togolais et, euh, et au niveau. This is something that holds great value in Togo Benin. Celui qui le porte. The person wearing it has the same power, holds the same power as the one who created, for, who created it in the first place. Should a king uh, be unable to travel around, the handing over of this stick is a way for him to uh, procure a great power to the person carrying it momentarily. There have also been other scepters. The Shango scepter here is the uh, scepter of the divinity of storm, which is never shown. Une adepte, généralement, avec une petite... It is too dangerous, and you can see here and a, a follower here and the uh, storm represented at the, at the top. So you have here a number of costumes of people and the uh, different uh, attributes. Avant de se battre avec une frénésie et une efficacité redoutable. So you have the Amazons here who also demonstrate the physicality of the dances and this uh, can also go back to the origins of the Black Indian. So thank you for your attention and uh, thank you to, for having listened to the archaeology of rituals that were uh, so, um, uh, that are so precious to us at uh, this museum. Thank you, Philippe. We've gone over time, but I think we can still take one or two questions. At the back, I can see someone. Thank you for this presentation. Merci pour la présentation. J'ai une question qui me tarabe. I have a question that I'm actually thinking of since the very beginning. I came to this uh, show because of uh, the very sort of catchy title, Black Indians. Uh, and uh, for me, uh, uh, when we talk about Indians, I think about everything that uh, I've been told in Hollywood or uh, things that I've learned uh, from my reading of classics such as The Last of the Mohicans. And for me, these are people that live in territories uh, that were invaded by Europeans. And, and so for me, Indians were natives of these territories, and the idea of black Indians was rather surprising to me, historically and culturally speaking. Uh, what would you say about that? Uh, is that a question? <laughs> well, uh, would you say it's a reality? Well, do you want to respond? Yes, it is a, a real. And this is something that we will talk about this afternoon and tomorrow as well with some of our colleagues, uh, uh, including Aurélie Godet. So uh, you can listen to her and uh, you'll get your answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so when are we going to take a break and we're going to come back at 2 p.m. Um, for the uh, rest of the events of the symposium. Thank you.